Okay, so you're building these three things into relationships. Honor, the ability to uh, see value in someone. Value. Trust. The, the ability to be uh, forthcoming, honorable, reliable, faithful, truthful, building trust into a relationship. And, and these two right here build security. So, uh, uh, again, I'll use the, your employer as an example. Value. Your employer sees that you value your job. You value him. Your employer sees that you're trustworthy. He sees that you're truthful. Uh, and then building that security, he knows he can count on you. And what happens that as a result? You keep your job, you probably get a raise, and you probably get value to a higher position. That's just an employer. Um, how about your children? Your children see your, the, how you value them. Your children see that they can trust you. They can rely on you. Um, you're dependable. You're truth trustworthy. You're uh, loyal. You're faithful. Uh, I always tell parents, let your yes be yes and your no be no with your children. If you're gonna, if you're gonna tell your kids no, no never means maybe. Do you know that? Ever. No means no. Yes means yes. And when a parent takes no and turns it into maybe, this starts to erode. When a parent says yes and then says no, this starts to erode. Um, and how does a child feel secure? By having these in their relationship. So... This tripart is critical in every relationship, and obviously in a marriage, same thing. Value, trust, brings security. Do you know that 90% of all marriage arguments is because somebody's insecure? Think about that. 90% of all marriage arguments is because somebody is insecure. Wow. That's pretty hot. So uh, if you find yourself in a situation where there's dissension, arguing, bickering, uh, try to f explore the root. You know, how am I insecure in some area or am I causing insecurity in some area? You know, the... Uh, your kids, ask yourself, you know, am I causing insecurity? Uh, or am I insecure? Uh, and so it's good to examine yourself. And the tripod is the excellent. This is an excellent illustration, guys. Excellent. Now... These three legs in the tripod. And I, I didn't really think this through till today. Today I just had an epiphany. An epiphany. I had a, had a wow moment today. This tripod is not going to happen unless I ask God for wisdom. Wisdom. I, I've, I've realized, I've come to realize that that's what's missing in our lives is wisdom. You know, when you think about it, every, every mistake we make is because we lack wisdom. Every wrong turn we take is because we lack wisdom. Every wrong statement, every wrong comment, Everything we do in life that turns bad on us is because we did not exercise wisdom. So put wisdom at the top of the tripod. Let it stand right here, right on the top. And if I would have thought of this weeks ago, I would have put wisdom up here. 
But this just came to me today. I realized today that wisdom has got to stand tall. And how do we get wisdom? Anybody have a clue where we might get wisdom? And where does it say in the Bible that we ask God? James 1. I think it's verse 4. I'm not sure. I'll just say it's verse 4. Some of you geniuses can tell me. Um, okay, with that being said, we're going to move into an area that destroys, weakens, diminishes, and erodes relationships. Does anybody know what that subject is? Anger. 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 Wow. Anger. Hmm. Oh, anger. Anger, anger. Boy, I'm going to hurt some people's feelings tonight. I don't mean to. I really don't mean to hurt your feelings, but I'm going to be truthful. And you know me. I'm always going to be truthful because even though the truth hurts, we need to hear it. We need to hear it. Anger. Why do we get angry? What makes us angry? Huh. Wow, what makes us angry? Hmm. There's a couple things that makes us angry. I would start with this. What makes us angry the most is not seeing the sovereignty of God in any situation or circumstance. That's what makes us angry. Not seeing the sovereignty of God or the providence of God in our lives. Because if we truly believe the Bible, then we have to believe that God is sovereign in all areas of our life and he, he rules. His providence rules over all the affairs of man. All the affairs of man. So we have a situation where someone makes us angry and then we have to think, hmm, did God see that coming? Yes, he did. So, looking at anger. I'm going to give you three simple reasons why you get angry. Three simple reasons. Number one, you get angry when you're hurt. You get hurt. Someone hurts your feelings. Someone hurts your pride. You get angry. Number two, you get angry when you have fear. Fear makes you angry. If you, if you ever know somebody that has a lot of fears in their life, they fear this, they're afraid of that, they're afraid of this, they're afraid of that, you'll find that that person tends to be a very angry person. So fear. Now what's the third one? Num number three is frustration. Now what is frustration? Somebody describe to me what you think frustration means. Not getting what you want when you want it. That's pretty good. What a guy. Not getting what you want when you want it. And you get frustrated. I couldn't have said it better, John. You're a genius. <laughs> Not getting what you want when you want it. I love that. I couldn't have said it better. Frustration. Wow. Hmm. Wow. Have you ever been late to go somewhere, but you need, need to stop off the store to pick something up that you need to bring to where you're going, to, and you're late going there, and you get in there, you get your stuff, and the, the, the cashier is taking forever. It's like you wonder if she ever went to kindergarten. And you're, you're sitting there, and the more you're 
steaming over her the slower she gets. What starts to develop? Anger. Anger. That's what starts to develop. Anger. So these are your three areas. Hurt, fear, frustration. So I'm going to read some scriptures and you're going to listen carefully to the scriptures, okay? Here we go. Psalm 37, 1 through 11. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. Now, evildoers and those who are, are, are working iniquity, they can frustrate you. They can make you angry. Why? Because they're not supposed to act that way, right? So that you make, they can make you angry. For they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Now, if you trust in the Lord and do good and dwell in the land and feed off of his faithfulness, instead of fretting, you'll find that you won't be as angry. Do you have a family member or a relative or a friend that you just get so frustrated with them because they keep screwing up and keep screwing up and they keep screwing up and you're the one that bails them out all the time. And you're the one that always has to come to their rescue. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> and it makes you angry. But we're to trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord. And he shall give you the desire of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way because of them who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. Do not fret, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you, be, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall not be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. What do you think of that scripture? God has a place for those who frustrate you. God has a place for those who don't measure up to you. You just do good. You trust in the Lord. You delight in the Lord. And God will take care of the mess. God will take care of the mess. It's what he does. And if we trust in the Lord, it says that we shall delight ourselves in the abundance of peace. Peace is the opposite of anxiety. Anger. Wow. Wow. Anger. Urgh. You ever felt like that? Urgh. You even say like, you even come up with some fake curse words. Because you can't say the real ones. You're a Christian. I should be Anger. Matthew 5, 43, 44. 
You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You have heard it said. But the Lord says to you, the Lord says, Jesus Christ himself says to you. This is what he says. Love your enemy. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now that's what Jesus said. So what are we going to do? We're going to love our enemies. We're going to bless those who curse us. We're going to do good to those who hate us. We're going to pray for those who spitefully use us and, and persecute us. Hmm. How do we do that? We exercise wisdom. And if we don't have wisdom, we ask for it. That's how we're going to do it. I, I, I mean, this hit me like a, like, wow, today. I just, bam, it hit me straight on today. The only way we're going to make it is by wisdom, God's wisdom. And if anyone lacks wisdom, he says, let them ask God. And God gives it abundantly to anyone who asks. And he says that when we ask for wisdom, wisdom, we're not to doubt that he'll give it to us. Because if we doubt that God will give us the wisdom, he says, why should I give it to you then? So you're in a situation, you know you're going to blow a fuse, and you know it's coming, and you cry out to the Lord for wisdom, and then you just choose not to believe that he's really going to give it to you. And then he says, he's not going to give it to you. Why? Because you don't believe he's going to give it to you. So we've got to ask for wisdom, believe he's going to give it to us, and then we have to exercise the wisdom God gives us. Or else... We're not going to be able to love our neighbor, um, love those who are enemies. We're not going to be able to love those and bless those who curse us. We're not going to be able to do good to those who hate us. We're not going to be able to pray for those who spitefully use us. Now, I don't know what everyone in this room or on the camera out in... Um, internet land. I don't know what your home relationships are like. I don't know what your work relationships are like. I don't know what your life is like. I just don't know. I don't have a little camera in your house, so I can't tell. But you know the truth about your life. You know the truth about your relationships. So you have to be honest with yourself. Lord, I can't do that. I couldn't possibly do those things to that person. I can't love my enemy. I can't pray for those who spitefully use me. Lord, I can't. I can't possibly go there and bless those who curse me. Lord, what are you asking me to do? And God is saying, I'm asking you to trust me with all of your heart. And stop leaning on your own understanding. But just take the time to acknowledge me. And I'll get you through this situation. That's it. Honestly. I have a, a friend. And I won't mention his name. But I have a, a friend that I grew up in high school with. Surfed with in Long Island. Um, went to school with. Hung out with. Moved down here to Florida with lived with in Florida as a teenager, surfed, had a great time. And um, I don't know what happened. Maybe it was because I became a pastor. I don't know. It just, it kind of deteriorated. And I was going down the road one day and as loud as he could scream it to the top of his lungs, he was like, F you take up easy. I was like, wow. I turned my car around, I pulled up to him, I go, hey, what's up? Said, hey. I 
I didn't know what to do. I'm a Christian. I can't react. I can't. I can't react because I want him saved. I want him to know Jesus. What am I going to do? I can't react. I got to rea- I, I got to be cool. I got to handle this right. I can't. Something inside of me was crying out for wisdom. I didn't even know it. And God gave me wisdom. And that person now comes to our church. And that person, uh, we've, we've fixed things up. God is working on that person, even as we speak. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. I know he didn't mean it. I know that he was going through things in his life, causing fear and causing hurt, frustration. And, um, and he just needed to just let it out. And it's so easy to let ourselves... <laughs> But the better path is the path that God recommends. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Proverbs 14, 29. He who is slow to wrath has great understanding. But he who is impulsive exalts folly, foolishness. Childlike foolishness, folly. He who is slow to wrath has great understanding. Hmm. Now, being slow to wrath doesn't mean being slow to pretend you don't have wrath. It means being slow to let wrath ferment in your heart. So you can fake it on the outside, but you've got to fix it on the inside. Being slow to let it fer- ferment. You don't want to fan the coals of anger or bitterness. Slow to wrath. Great understanding. How would you describe, why would you have greater understanding if you're slow to wrath? Why would you have greater understanding? Anybody have a clue? Huh? Yeah? Yeah, you're willing to listen to all of the information? Yeah? Also, you're giving God time to work it out in your heart. God wants to work it out in your heart. Why? God wants you to be an example in the midst of your enemies, in the midst of your those who curse you, in the midst of those who use you. God wants you to still be Jesus in those circumstances, in those situations. Now, a lot of times you'll go to a study like this and you'll be like, oh yeah, I'm learning so much. This is so wonderful. I'm going to start treating everybody so nice except for the person I live with. Isn't that a shame? But usually that's the way it happens. I'm going to be so nice to everybody except for the person I live with. Why? Because they're idiots. (laughs) Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know, I love the way Paul says this. He says, and we know That's how he starts this verse out. And we know, and we do know, that God works all things together for good to those who love him. To those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. For we know, and we do know that God works all things together, don't we? But why do we lose sight of that in the, in, when we get frustrated? Why do we lose sight of that when we get, when we get hurt? Why do we lose sight of that when we're, we have fear? 
What, what happens to that reality that we know? How do we lose that reality that we know? Paul says, and we know that God works all things together for good. We know that we love God. We know that we're called according to his purpose. And we know that he works all things together for good. So what, what happens? We lack wisdom. We lack wisdom. You can know the whole Bible inside and out. It's going to do you no good without God's wisdom. It'll do you no good at all without the wisdom of God. Wow. Can we go on? Proverbs 50, 15, verse 1. Proverbs 15, verse 1. A slow answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Hmm. Wow. How many of you in here have a s real short fuse? A really short fuse. I mean, it's like you wear your button like way out here. You hold the button out. Just push my button. Go ahead. Push my button. Go ahead. Some people live like that. Go ahead. Push my button. Fear. What are we afraid of? Hurt. What's hurting us? Frustration. What are we frustrated about? Push my button. Just push my button. Are we afraid people won't like us? Are we afraid we don't measure up? Are we afraid we won't be accepted? Are we afraid we won't fit in? Well, those fears will get us upset sometimes. Oh, they're talking about me. They don't even know you exist. And you're worried about them talking about you. We waste so much time worrying about what people think, what people say, or what we think they're saying. I've come to realize that people don't even really think about us. <laughs> They've got so much going on in their own lives, you're the last thing on their minds. You might think, oh, well, you're the pastor. They probably think about you. They probably don't. <laughs> they probably don't. You know when they think about me? When they walk in the church and go, oh, yeah, that is a pastor. And we waste so much time thinking about what people think about us. Wow, what a waste. What a waste of a life. Because your mind and Satan's help will allow you to think that they're talking about you. That they don't like you. That they're making fun of you. And all of that is probably the furthest thing from their minds. And you waste your time and energy Getting angry for nothing. Romans 12, verse 19 through 21. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, Give them a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire upon their head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. How many of you ever heard that verse? That's a good verse. So if your enemy is hungry, you feed them. If your enemy is thirsty, you give them something to drink. And in so doing, you're going to set their head on fire. And then there, they deserve it. Right? No. Wrong. Keeping coals on their head in Jesus' day was something of a blessing. Because when your fire went out in your home, there's, there's a special fire urn that would fit on your head with a damp rag and an urn. And between your head and the top of the urn, there would be a place for coals. And you would go to your neighbor's house and you would say, my fire went out. Could I have some of your embers? And they would put some embers in your urn and you would carry the 
coals back to your home so you can warm your home and feed your family. So feeding them and giving them something to drink, you will heap coals upon their head. You'll bless them. You'll bless them. Because to think that you'd set their head on fire would be a contradiction of what God's trying to tell you to do, right? So you want to bless them. Bless those. I think of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every single one of us deserved to have our heads set on fire. But Jesus fed us and gave us something to drink and then laid his life on the cross because he loved us. And we were his enemy. He loved us. And so Jesus sets the example and he sets the bar. Anger. Jesus doesn't have a place for anger. Matter of fact, when he was hanging on the cross, bleeding out of every part of his body, his skin hanging off him like ribbons, beaten, whipped, he was mutilated. Thorns beaten into his skull, two spikes in his hands, a spike in his feet, and people spitting on him, laughing at him, mocking him, and Jesus looked up into heaven and said, Father, forgive them. They really don't know what they're doing. Jesus set the bar. He set the bar. So how are we going to be angry? Proverbs 15, 28. The heart of the righteous studies how to answer. But the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. Hmm. The heart of the righteous studies how to answer. The heart. Not the head, not the mind. The heart studies how to answer. There's got to be a way to answer this situation, to diffuse it, to fix it, to even make it wonderful. It's, it's very possible in a situation where someone is agitated or someone is agitating you or someone is not being right, there could be a godly, incredible, wise, and miraculous way to turn that whole situation to cause them to see Jesus. There is. But that comes when the heart finds the answer. How many of you are quick to defend yourself? Quick. And you're alert. Extremely alert of, of criticism. Man, when criticism comes your way, you're like, hmm. And you'll defend yourself. You can't even hold your mouth back. You're like, Woof, right on it. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Dangerous. Extremely dangerous. Defend yourself. When Jesus was accused, he opened not his mouth. Think about that. When Jesus was accused, he opened not his mouth. What did he open? His heart. Isn't that amazing? He opened not his mouth. He opened his heart. Wow. Jesus sets the bar. He's our example. Anybody learning anything tonight? Okay. We're having fun? Okay, how many people are never going to come back to the class? <laughs> it's going to get better after the, tonight. Galatians 5, 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh, it lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things you want, you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, 
You are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, reviles, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand. Just as I told you in times past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. What does that mean? How many of you know for certain that you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? You know. You know that you really did surrender your heart to Jesus Christ and you're born. You're a believer in Christ, right? Now, when you became a believer, what did Christ give you? What did he give you for eternity? The Holy Spirit. And where is the Holy Spirit? He gave it to you. And where did he put it when he gave it to you? In your heart. It's inside of you, right? The Holy Spirit is in you, right? So it says the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. If there's no law, then there's grace. If there's grace and the Holy Spirit is in you, then I believe with all my heart you're walking in the Spirit. Now you can quench the Spirit. You can quench the Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is in you. You're walking in the Spirit. Because if you were walking in the flesh and you were committing adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfishness, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, reviles, and the like, you would not be able to go to heaven, and therefore you get the Holy Spirit taken away from you, you get all of God's treasures and gifts taken away from you, and you go to hell. That can't happen. So we can walk in the Spirit because the Spirit's in us and we are eternal bound but we can quench the Spirit. We can wound the Spirit. We can hurt the Spirit of God. We can can sin. But because we are in the Spirit we we are not under the law. We're under grace. And where where sin abounds, what sin abounds? I go through the list again, right? This is the only list. There's about five or six lists in the Bible. If you add them up, there's like 40 different sins that kicks you out of heaven. So, if, when when the sin is in my life, and if the sin is in my life and abounding, What abounds when sin abounds? Grace abounds. And what is grace? It's God's miraculous ability to come into my life and start guiding me in the way I should go. And it's amazing ability to give me that power and the desire to want to follow him in the way I should go. So for for a Christian that walks in the Spirit the, the Holy Spirit will take whatever sin we're walking in and he will guide us, direct us, and put us on the right path. So one of those things that which it, in that list is selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder. What is all those things related to? Anger. So According to that list, you angry Christians are going to hell. No. 
you angry Christians can have grace abounding towards you. You can have grace abound. The Holy Spirit's in you. You're walking in the Spirit. The law does not have power over you. You have God's Holy Spirit wanting to guide you in the path you should go. And therefore, when you're angry, after tonight, you know what you should do. You pray and ask the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you for the wisdom of God. And when the wisdom of God rises up inside of you, look what happens. You will have the ability to have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what will happen. That's what will happen. Why? Because you're walking in the Spirit. And when you ask for wisdom... Oh, I'm blown away with this whole wisdom thing. I am just blown away with this whole wisdom thing. It's the key. No wonder he told us to ask for it. We need it. Every situation that we blow is because we did not exercise wisdom. Wow. Okay. Let's continue. Proverbs 16.32 he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Hmm. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Hmm. Wow. Are you one of these people that have a very short fuse? Anything can set you off? Hmm. Then you're not very mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Wow. It, it, is, it is so critical for us to exercise the ability to not be angry. It's, it's, it blows the whole witness. It destroys the whole witness. It really does. Ephesians 4.26 Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. If I have hurt somebody, wounded someone, if I have hurt, if I've made someone angry, if I've made someone uh, disappointed in me, or if I've hurt someone, uh, I can't rest till I fix that. I can't. I have to fix it. I just can't be at peace. And I don't even care if they were more at fault than me. I have to fix it. Because my spirit is grieving. Anybody say, I feel like that too? Yeah. My spirit hurts if I wound somebody. I can't be at rest. I gotta fix it. it. It really is a sign that we're Christians. If you experience that, then you know, hey, I must be saved. Proverbs nineteen eleven: the discretion of a man makes him slow to angry anger, and his glory to overlook a transgression. His glory is to overlook a transgression. Hmm. Can you do that? Can you just let it go? Ephesians 4.29. Now, I... I, I I pointed out last week that it's harder for women to let it go than men. Um, I don't know. Men are able to just move on. We're, we're compartmentalized. That's what men are. We, you know, if we're at work, we're at work. If we're at home, we're at home. If we're, you know, we're able to just go, shh, shh. we're compartmentalized. So when someone 
hurts us or wounds us, well, when we leave that compartment and we're in this compartment, that, that went away. But women are not compartmentalized. Everything in a woman's life is connected to her. It's all intertwined. It's, it's all a part of who she is. So if someone hurt her, they take that to work. They take that to the grocery store. They take that to church. They take that everywhere because it's a part of who they are. It all flows together. So it's a little more difficult for women to let a transgression go than a man. So what does that mean, girls? It means that you need a lot of wisdom. You got to pray a lot of wisdom into that circumstance. Um, I said that men have shredders and women have filing cabinets. Yeah. You, you'll say, well, you, you did that last, last Christmas. And we're like, what do you mean? I, did? I don't remember that. Why don't we remember that? Because we have a shredder. We don't have that in the file. Isn't that great? God's so good to us guys. <laughs> I don't remember that. When did I do that? Beautiful. Huh? Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing in our office space. <laughs> Proverbs 19.11 The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger. And the glory is to overlook a transgression. Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Instead, what is good for necessary edification, that it might impart grace to the hearer. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. If the devil ever whispers in your mouth into your ear and says, Say this to that person. Just look at the devil and say, no, that's not nice. That's not nice, devil. I'm not going to say that. Because he wants you to say that. And why does he want you to say that? Because the, lo the devil loves to divide people. He does. He wants division, not unity. He wants division. He's working his magic in the country today. Proverbs, uh, I mean, Proverbs 25, 28. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broke down without walls. Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another even as God and Christ forgave you. So just like Christ forgave you, you ought to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Tender-hearted. 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 Wow. Tender-hearted. How am I going to be tender-hearted? I'm going to pray for wisdom. I'm going to be slow to speak. I'm going to shut my mouth. Let the Holy Spirit work on my heart. I'm going to pray for wisdom. I'm going to choose my words carefully. Carefully. I'm going to make sure that my words are wholesome to edifying and building up whoever it is I'm dealing with. James chapter 4, 1 through 3. Where do wars and fights come from among you? He asked this question. Here James is asking, where do fights and wars come from among you. How do you get around to quarreling? How do you get around to arguing? Where do they come from? And then he says where they come from. Do they not come from your desire for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. 
You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Well, you do ask. And you don't receive because you ask amiss that you might spend it on your own pleasures. So James is saying that we argue and fight because we're not getting our way. What is he basically saying? We argue and fight because we're selfish. That's basically what he's saying. If you can't be slow to anger, if you can't be slow to wrath, if you can't have a wholesome word come out of your mouth, if you can't choose to edify, then the problem is you're selfish. Who, me? Yeah, me. You're selfish. I'm not selfish. I'm a Christian. You're a selfish Christian. None of you, of course. You're all perfect. Selfishness is our biggest enemy. It is a terrible thing in our lives. It really is. Selfishness is a horrible thing in our lives. And what is selfishness? It's our ability to mentally conjure up the thought that we deserve something. That's what selfishness is. It's, it's the ability for our minds to conjure up the idea that we actually deserve something. And in reality, we deserve nothing. That's the truth. We deserve nothing at all. And if we deserve nothing at all, then guess what? Everything's a bonus in life. Everything. Every single thing in life is a bonus when we don't deserve anything. How do we get there? What do we pray for? Wisdom. We pray for wisdom. Wow. Wow. Anger, it is like It is just rot to your soul. And it makes you feel horrible. When someone drives you to anger, you feel miserable. You feel terrible inside. It ruins your whole day. It eats you up all day long. You just have no peace, no rest. It's a horrible feeling to be angry. And that's why God so desires for us to let it go. He wants us to have peace. He really does. So when conflicts arise, the first thing we do is what? Pray. And pray for wisdom. What is the second thing we do? We trust in God's word. I think one of the greatest tools in my Christian life is memorizing scriptures. I have a host of scriptures that I've memorized. They're my go-tos. They're, it's where I run. It's it's my it's it's my it's my lifeline. It's my oxygen, my spiritual oxygen. Here's a memory verse for you: Philippians four six and seven. It says to be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for what? Nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. So the alternative to being anxious would be what? Pray. With thanksgiving. What am I going to be thankful for? Agitated. Is there anything in your life that you could be thankful for in your agitation? Do you have anything? Huh? We have a God to go to. What else? We don't have poison ivy. We have a house, a bed. I mean, what could we, we, what could we be thankful for? We, we don't have cancer. What could we be thankful for? Wow. My leg's not broken. I can be thankful I don't have a broken leg. <laughs> How, what can I be thankful for? A million things that I could be thankful for. 
right? So we need to take inventory of our blessings. That's what it means, be thankful. Take inventory of your blessings. So be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. And taking inventory of your blessings, tell God what the problem is. Tell him. God, I know that you bless me. Lord, I know how rich my life is. Lord, I am so grateful for everything you do in my life. God, I'm so grateful for everything. Lord, I am so blessed that you're in my life. But I got this problem that I'm concerned with. I've got this issue that I'm, I'm hurting over, Lord. And then it says something else. What does it say next? And after you pray with gratitude and tell God what's going on in your life, it says that the peace of God will guard what? Your heart and mind. Why is it important to have that heart and mind guarded? Your mind is a runaway train. Anybody ever lay in bed and have the ready, ready, runaway train just, just full bore down the track? Yeah. Your mind, the runaway train. He guards your heart and mind. What is your heart? Your heart is the thing that stirs up the emotions. It's the thing that gets your heart beating. It's the thing that gets you all wigged out and anxious. So he guards your heart. He guards your mind. Wow. Through how? Jesus. And God will give you the ability to not have to understand the situation. He'll give you the ability to not have to understand the situation. Why? Because the trust in his sovereignty, you know that God understands the situation. Do you believe that God understands every situation you go through? Everyone? Every situation you're dealing with? Does God understand? Of course he does. You don't have to understand it because he does. And he's for you, not against you. He's for you, not against you. And the great gates of hell cannot prevail against you. He goes before you. He hedges you from behind. He holds you in the palm of his hand. He shadows you with his wings. You don't have to understand. He understands. And that will give you the peace you need that guards your heart and mind. So when conflicts arise, listen carefully to the other person. Write that as big and bold as you can. When conflicts arise, listen carefully to the other person. It's so important to try to recognize where the conflict is coming from. The only way you're going to understand where the conflict is coming from is your ability to listen to the other person. Listen. With God's wisdom and with God's love and your ability to be slow in the situation and willing to hear the other person, there's a good chance that God's going to give you the ability to even go beyond what you think or ask. He can do miraculous things. Proverbs 18, 13. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. It's childlike foolishness. And you ought to be ashamed to not be willing to listen to a matter. 
James 1.19, My son, my beloved brethren, let every man and let every woman be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Proverbs 15, 23. And a word spoken in due season, how good it is. A word spoken in due season, how good it is. It is. And we're almost finished. Define the problem. Try to define the problem. When you feel yourself getting anxious, this fear, hurt, disappointment, discouragement. Try to define the problem. Take time. Get alone. Sit with the Lord. Think it through. Before anything comes out of your mouth, try to define the problem. Five, the next thing is to state the area of agreement and disagreement in the conflict. State the area of agreement or disagreement in the conflict. That's after you defined it. That's after you prayed for wisdom. That's after you were slow to wrath. That's after you meditated on the Lord. That's after you prayed and chose not to be anxious. With thanksgiving, you prayed. Then you state the area of agreement or disagreement in the conflict. Because now you know that you're doing it through the power of the Holy Spirit and now it can be properly taken care of. The next thing, identify your own contribution to the problem. The word is identify. Identify your own contribution to the problem. You have no idea how huge that is. The success rate of resolving a problem really does hinge in that one area. That's huge. Identify your own contribution to the problem. When you accept some responsibility for the problem, the other person sees the willingness to cooperate and will probably be much more open to discuss the problem. Okay? We, we mentioned that last week, but it, it's worth mentioning again. I will read that one more time. Identify your own contribution to the problem. When you accept some responsibility for the problem, the other person sees a willingness to cooperate and will probably be, be much more open to discussion. Isn't that nice? Let's talk about it. But many times when we want to talk about it, we want to talk about it the way we want to talk about it. Right? I want to talk about it, but I want to talk about it. No, we need to talk about it. We need to talk about it. Make sure your conversation is based in reality. That's a big one. Make sure your conversation is based in reality. And here's the last one. Ask God for direction. Ask God for direction. 
and then expect that he'll give it to you through the word of God. The, God's best answers come from his own holy word. The word of God is God's spoken word to us. So ask God for direction and then read God's word. And through the reading of God's word, the leading of the Holy Spirit, then you're equipped to brainstorm solutions and come up with answers. God gave us a brain. It doesn't mean we're not supposed to use it. But we need to use it after we're fully equipped through the power of the Holy Spirit and the word of God. God gave us a brain. We can brainstorm how to answer, how to resolve, we can brainstorm solutions to the problem. But brainstorming comes after we are fully filled, engulfed with the Holy Spirit. So, we'll turn the camera off. Next week, the title for next week is Put a Vice Grip on Your Attitude. Put a vice grip on your attitude.